All right, welcome to session three of Understanding Grace. Um, we're talking about the grace of God, what that is, and defining it through the scriptures. Uh, again, this is going to be a two-part, or uh, there's two parts to all of these sessions. We're in the first part right now, and that is a foundation that we're laying that Jesus uh, operated as a man anointed by the Spirit of God, and that anointing is how he did everything that he did. He did not do it because he was divine, even though he was divine. We saw in Philippians how he laid aside and stripped himself of that power and that glory, came to the earth as a man. And in all aspects, every aspect, he became a man just like you and I. When I say man, I'm referring to man and woman. And so Jesus became in all aspects human, just like you and I. And he did that because he would be and is the model and the blueprint for all of mankind as to how a righteous son of God operates in the earth. And so he did everything that he did, anointed by the spirit, yielding to the grace of God, so that he could show us how it's done. We talked about how that when when people try to put Jesus in a God class, even though we're not saying he wasn't God, but again, he stripped himself. So when you look at his life and ministry, the Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, if you try to put that in a God class, untouchable, undoable, uh, uh, unrepeatable by any human being, then we lose hope of how we're supposed to be the body in the earth. When Jesus was in the earth, he was the body of Christ, the only body of Christ in the earth. When he went to heaven, the scripture says that uh, in Ephesians 1, that he has become the head of the body, which he's no longer the whole body. We are joined with him, and now we are the body of Christ in the earth. He's the head we are the body. So the body today is to be exactly like the body was over 2,000 years ago when he walked, walked the earth. So when we see uh, Jesus in Matthew and Mark and Luke and John, it's, it's imperative that we see him as a man anointed by the Spirit in action, showing us how we're supposed to do it, showing us what we're supposed to look like in action. So he becomes the one that we look to. Uh, he becomes the one that we keep our eyes on. Uh, we don't try to pattern ourselves after any other man or woman in the earth. If you do, you're shooting lower than you're supposed to. We're supposed to look to Jesus and pattern ourselves after Jesus. So uh, we, we said that the grace of God is the supernatural ability and the divine favor of God given to you entirely apart from merit. You did, what you have done in your life has nothing to do with the grace of God that God has given you and that is to come to you. So the supernatural ability, the divine favor of God given to us entirely apart from merit, causing us to be able to do what we could never do in our own strength. And so grace is the strength, the ability, the empowerment of God. So let me make a statement here, and I'll refer back to this many times, that grace and the anointing are practically the same thing. When the Bible refers to the anointing, it's referring to the grace of God, the empowerment of the Spirit. So grace is the empowerment of the Spirit within, upon that, that, that we have today. So if the anointing is the power of the spirit and grace is the power of the spirit, then they're in essence the same thing. So you could say that Jesus did what he did by the anointing. You could also say it this way. Jesus did what he did by grace or through grace or in the grace of God. So as we study the grace of God, we're, we're actually studying the anointing. We're studying the power of the Holy Spirit. And as we get into these scriptures, every scripture that we look at gives us a perspective of what grace is. 
And so, you know, if you really wanted to get to know me and the only way that you could get to know me was talking to other people about me, then how much would you really get to know me if you only talked to one person and got their opinion of me? I think so many times that's where we miss it in life is we put our judgment and our opinions about people based on one thing that we've heard about them. And that's, that's really unfair. Well, it's unfair to the grace of God. It's unfair to God to only look at him or look at grace from one perspective or even two or three perspectives and then come up with a full conclusion as if we know what the grace of God is or we know who, who God is. And so it's so important. That's why it's important to get into the word of God and let the word of God get into you. Jesus said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, we have to abide in the word of God, take up residence, settle down in to the word of God. So when we get into the word and we look at any subject, when we look at it from one scripture, we have a perspective. From another scripture, we have a new perspective. From another scripture, we have a new perspective. What happens if we look at every scripture on a subject? Then we walk around the entire mountain of that subject, looking at it from every perspective, and we get a full view of what this is. Now we can now we can make our judgment. Now we can look at it and make a decision. Okay, here's what this is. That's what's going to happen by the end of this course. You're going to look at grace and you're going to, you're going to, you're going to feel on the inside. Okay, I feel like I have a grip on what grace is, how it's accessed, what it looks like in my life, what it's supposed to look like in my life. So it becomes your hope. And so uh, as we get into this, that's, that's exactly what's going to happen. So we talked about that. And so don't forget that. And you can maybe write that down as one, one of your takeaways. As we study this, you'll see that grace and the anointing are practically the same thing. We also said this yesterday or, or the last session that uh, when you lose sight of the humanity of Jesus, when you stop reading Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John and seeing that he did it as a man anointed by the Spirit, when you don't know that or when you lose sight of that, you lose sight of who you are in Christ, because what you see in Jesus is a picture of what you're supposed to do. So when you lose sight of that humanity, you, you forget, wait a minute, this is, this is what my life is supposed to look like. This is what my ministry is supposed to look like, what Jesus did in the earth. Remember, Jesus said, the works that I do, you'll do also, and greater works than these, because I go unto the Father. So this is session three, and we're going to get into this. And if you would turn in your Bible to Hebrews chapter two, and we're going to start with verse 14, Hebrews chapter two and verse 14. And remember, we, we ended last session on seeing uh, Jesus spoken of as the son of God through what the demons were challenging him. As Jesus cast out demons, as he as he, as he used the anointing or the grace of God against the power of the enemy, they challenged him. They said, this is not fair. You're not, you're not supposed to be able to be here at this time. There is an appointed time, but you're here before the time. They said, we know who you are, son of God. Are you here to torment us before the time? That's there in Matthew chapter eight. And so Jesus, uh, they recognized him. They, rec they, they knew there's something about him that's different than anybody else. We sense the divine. We sense authority, and that's not supposed to be. So you're here illegally. And Jesus said, the Father has given me power. There in John chapter five, we started with the scripture. The Father has given me authority to execute judgment also because I am the son of man. So that's why we're looking at the humanity of Jesus. So Hebrews chapter two, we're going to start with verse 14. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself, speaking of Jesus, likewise shared in the same. He himself shared in the same. The same what? He took, uh, he partook of flesh and blood. He became human that through death, he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, verse 15, and release those who through fear of death 
were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Verse 16, for indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Now watch verse 17. Therefore, in other words, whenever you see the word therefore, you need to understand what it's there for. It's tying everything that he just said above to what he's about to say. So speaking of Jesus becoming flesh and blood, partaking of flesh and blood, coming to the earth as a man. Verse 17, therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren. In all things, Jesus had to be made like his brethren. In how many things? In all things. In the way that we're tempted, yeah, he was tempted in every way just like us. In uh, every emotional experience that we, uh, that we experience in life, yeah, he was made in all things like his brethren. That he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Verse 18, for in that he himself has suffered being tempted as a man, he is able to aid all those who are tempted. Why? Because he experienced exactly what you're experiencing. You you might say, well, wait a minute. I've experienced some temptations that It's just hard for me to think that Jesus went through those same temptations. Well, know that he did. He did go through every temptation, every uh, anger temptation, every temptation to lose your temper, every sexual temptation, every temptation in all things, he had to be made like his brethren. He was tempted, the scripture says, in every way, just like us. So, why is it important to see Jesus as the son of man? Because he's an example of victory. He's an example of overcoming. Did he overcome every sexual temptation? Absolutely. He didn't yield to it. He overcame it. You say, well, yeah, but that was Jesus. But don't forget, Jesus did it as a man. He did it as a man yielding to the grace of God. So in every way that he was tempted, we can overcome the same temptation because Jesus did. It's not not unfair to say, well, Jesus did it, you can do it. So if Jesus did it, and he did, we know that he never sinned. Is it possible for us to never sin? Yeah, if you totally understand the grace of God and understand how to yield to it, does that mean that I'm never going to sin anymore? Probably not. You know, we all have uh, the, the same temptations and we're, we're yielding to those temptations, but here's the truth. Here's what you have to know. You don't have to. You can overcome it. Whatever you're being tempted with, maybe on a daily basis, whatever's, whatever you're going through right now, you can overcome it. Jesus is our pattern of victory. Jesus is our pattern of success. Jesus is our pattern for how to do things. If he did it, you can do it. That's why we're, we're supposed to look to him. So when you lose sight of this, you lose sight of what you can do. You lose sight of who you are. You lose sight of what you can be in the earth. And so this this ought to give you hope that things are about to change in your life. Things are about to get different in your life. The struggles that you have struggled with, you're about to overcome it because you're learning how to yield to the grace of God. Uh, Now, we got a long way to go before we get through all of this. And so don't think, well, man, it just seems like I can't. Well, that's okay. Don't don't think that what you're experiencing right now in your life is what you're always going to be experiencing because it's not. Things are going to change. And, you know, the fact that, that you may have some problems in your life right now, sins and tem- you're going through temptations and things like that, don't get condemned over that because God doesn't condemn you. He understands where you are. He knows what you're learning. He knows where you're heading. And he's he is forbearing. He, he is putting up, thank God, he has put up with so much of, of my failures for me to, to learn and grow and get to a place to where I'm an overcomer and I'm a conqueror of those things. I'm not there yet. You're not there yet, but we're on our way. So let's not get let's not get uh, get unsettled and antsy and and worried and concerned and anxious about where we are. 
just realize there is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. God is not condemning you. God is not uh, looking down on you. God is not upset with you. He's not tired of you yielding to the same thing over and over again. You know, sometimes we, we get a picture of God and we think, well, you know, God is kind of like our parents, you know, when we messed up, you know, they would give us that look. You know, my, my father had a way of looking at me and straightening me out because he knew how to give me that look of disappointment. And when I saw that look of disappointment, I knew, man, I'm wrong. I better straighten up. That's not how God operates. God doesn't have a look of disappointment. And whether wherever you are, if you think God is disappointed in you, you're wrong. You're, 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 you're operating out of a, a wrong image of God. God loves you. God is for you. He's your father. He, he's not disappointed in you. He knows that you're not going to succeed unless the, his word gets in you. And if you're watching this broadcast or this session, it's exactly why you're here. You're here to get the word in you. God's proud of you. God's, God's applauding you for where you are. You're, you, you, you won't settle for defeat. You're not planning on staying there the rest of your life. You're coming out of it. And so because you're coming out of it, you know, he, he's, he's proud of you. He's looking at you with a sense of, of, of appreciation for you because he loves you. And, he, and there is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. We're in Christ because of what Jesus did. Therefore, there should never, ever get a hold of this. There should never be a time that you feel condemned by God. Never. He gave you his word. He's ne I will never hold your sins against you. I will never condemn you. I will always be there for you to help you, to pull you out, to lift you up. To, to to sing your praises. You say, well, I know we're supposed to sing God's praises. Well, God sings your praises. He, he's in love with you. The, Isaiah said this, as a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. Is that the picture you have of God? If not, then change it right now. Let, let the Holy Spirit restore what, what the, your picture of God is supposed to be, you know? God loves you. He, he, get a picture of God, of God being for you and, and God smiling at you every day of your life. God is, is loving you and, and, and he's for you. If God be for us, who can be against us? All of these scriptures are, are to create an image of God of what you're supposed to have, an image of your sonship and an image of your father God so that you can be strong and, and overcome in life. That's exactly what God wants you to do is overcome. So, you know, there in Hebrews, uh, if you go on to read the next verse, you know, where it talks about that Jesus has suffered being tempted, he's able to aid those that are tempted, and he became in all points as we are. That next verse there, uh, if you keep reading, it says, so consider Jesus. Consider him. So whatever you're going through, uh, if you want to see what victory looks like, consider him. If you want to see where your life is heading, consider him. Whenever we're going through something, we're to consider him. Why? Because he's the captain of grace. He's he, he, The spirit of God is the giver of grace. So when we look to Jesus, you know, when I'm going through temptation, instead of looking to myself to see how strong I am or how strong I need to be, I'm to look at Jesus and say, Jesus, Holy Spirit, you're the giver of grace. And so I look to you right now. I look to your grace. I look to the ability that enabled you to live free from sin. I look to the ability that enabled you to lay hands on the sick. I look to the ability that enabled you to walk in authority and power and dominion as you walked. I look to you, Jesus. I consider you. So when we consider him, we're considering that he accessed the same thing we're to access. So by faith, when we look to him, we access the grace of God. Father, I access the same grace that Jesus accessed. I access the same power that Jesus accessed right now in my time of weakness, in my time of need, I access grace. That's why the scripture says, come boldly, Hebrews 4, come boldly to the throne of grace. That let's, let's just, let's turn over there and read that in Hebrews and chapter four. 
Man, this just fits in real good right here. In Hebrews chapter four, in verse 14, it says, seeing then that we have a great high priest, glory to God, who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the son of God. See, that's his divinity where he sits right now. He's, he's passed through the heavens. He's seated at the right hand of God. Let us hold fast our confession. Let's don't confess that we're weak. Let's don't confess that what are we going to do? How are we going to make it? I just don't know why this is happening. I, no, confess what the word of God says. He overcame, I can overcome. Let us hold fast our confession. Verse 50, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Glory to God. He was tempted just like me, yet without sin, to show me, hey, Dane, here's how you do this. Follow me. Uh, I became like you so that you could become like me. Follow me. Look to me. Keep your eyes on me. You know, when Peter was walking on the water with Jesus, you know, we forget that Jesus wasn't the only one that walked on water. Peter walked on water too. You know, he walked right out there to Jesus. But when he got his eyes on the circumstances, when he lost his confession, that's what this is talking about. When he, when he lost sight of, of what, what he was supposed to be doing, got his eyes on the circumstances, he began to sink. Why did he sink? Because he got his eyes off of Jesus. See, we're to consider Jesus. Jesus wanted Peter to say, hey, Peter, keep your eyes on me. Because if I walk on water, you can walk on water. If I'm doing this, you can do this. This is what God's saying to you today. Uh, hey, whatever your name is, if I overcame, you can overcame. Keep your eyes on me. Have some of the same grace that I walked in. Have some of the same anointing that I walked in. Receive it by faith. Receive my strength by faith. Receive my healing by faith. Receive what I walked in by faith because I walked in it so you could walk in it. He says that uh, he was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin, in all points. It, was it a real temptation? Did you, was Jesus really, was Jesus tempted with homosexuality? Well, let me ask you this. Are people tempted with homosexuality? Is it that some people that, that kind of makes their mind go tilt when they think that, but in order for him to come, become a, a good high priest to every person that's tempted with homosexuality, he had to be tempted with the same thing. Now, here's something to remember about temptation. Temptation is not sin. When people are tempted, it's not sin. Now, when you go after the temptation and you partake of it, then it's sin. And thank God there's forgiveness in the blood. You know, there's forgiveness in Jesus, but don't get condemned when you're tempted. You haven't done anything wrong. He says Jesus was tempted. If it was a real temptation, then he had to be tempted in every way, just like we are. He's tempted to rob. He's tempted to steal. He was tempted to make shortcuts. He was tempted to, to lie. He was tempted to cheat. He was tempted to do all these things. All these issues that we have problems with today, Jesus was tempted in the same way that we are. You say, well, how did he make it? Every time he was tempted, he looked to the Father, and he believed that the Father had supernatural power and divine favor to give him separate from his merit, entirely apart from his merit. Why? Because he was a son. Why was help given to Jesus? Because he was a son and because he received it by faith. So when he would go through these crazy temptations, he would look to the father and receive grace. And he would look to the father and lay hold of that anointing that belonged to him. And he would overcome it every single time. He did it perfectly. I'm so glad that he did it perfectly because he has become my model. He's become the person that I look to. The next verse says, let us therefore come both. Let us therefore, since he did this, let us therefore. What, is, what does it mean? Those first three words of Hebrews 4, 16, let us therefore. It, it means that this is how Jesus did it. 
This is exactly how Jesus accessed grace right here in Hebrews 4, 16. He said, he did it. He was tempted in every way like we are. He became in every point a man like we are. Let us therefore, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. The throne of what? Grace, glory to God. What is grace? Supernatural ability, divine favor, given to us apart from merit, causing us to do what we could never do in our own strength. He says, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy, that we may find grace. Why? That's how he did it. He said, he, Jesus was right up in this throne room. When he needed it, he accessed grace. Therefore, let us come boldly without condemnation to the throne room of grace and obtain mercy and find grace in time of need. What's your time of need? What's our time of need? It's the time when we need mercy. When do you need mercy? When you've blown it. That's the only time you need mercy. You don't need mercy if you hadn't blown it. That means all of us qualify. Every person watching this session three of Understanding Grace, you qualify for mercy because you've blown it. I'm not condemning you. I'm just saying we're all, we're all in that same group. So let's come boldly to the throne of grace, just like Jesus did. See, when you don't see Jesus as the son of man, then this verse doesn't mean anything to you. It, it, you know, you just think, oh, praise God, I can come boldly to the throne of grace. But when you get up in there, you, you think, well, what does God think of me? Or I don't know how God's relating to me or, uh, you know, what, what's going to happen? I know God's a God of power, but man, what, what, will he use that power against me? I, I, I don't see. No, when you see Jesus is the son of man and he's our example. And then the scripture says, in the same way you come, let us therefore come. Get mercy if you've blown it. Get grace if you're being tempted and you hadn't blown it yet. Get grace. That's what the throne room is for. Get mercy and get grace. And so he's our example. Don't consider anything else but him. You got to see him as the son of man. You got to see him as your example because grace won't make any sense to you unless that foundation of Jesus, the son of man being there. So Think about this, it's an, it's an antichrist spirit to, to come against grace. And we're gonna talk about this in the next session, but I wanna, I wanna kinda lead into this. Uh, we, we know the Bible talks about the antichrist and we, we know that, that uh, John said in 1 John that the, the spirit of antichrist is already in the world. So what is the antichrist spirit? What, what, is the, what does it mean to, to have an antichrist spirit? Well, think about the word anti and Christ. What, what does that mean? Well, antichrist, anti means to be against. You know, we have antiperspirant. When you wear it, it is against perspiration. It, it comes against it. And so anti means to be against something. So to be anti-Christ means to be against Christ. Some people say, well, I would never be against Christ. Well, think about what Christ means. Christ is not Jesus' last name. <laughs> you know, Jesus Christ, like Dane Massey. No, Christ was, was his title. Christ was what he had and who he was. Christ actually means the anointed one and the anointing. The anointing it means to, to uh, it refers to oil, refers to grease. It refers to having something that causes you to be able to uh, make it easier in life, you know? And, and so to be against Christ means to be against the anointing, to be against grace. Some people are coming against grace. You know, I know there's some extremes out there, but when you come against grace, the real message of grace, you're, you're yielding to the antichrist spirit. You're against the anointing. You're against grace. We're going to talk about that more in the next session. Hey, write down five takeaways and uh, talk about them with your group. If you're going through this with a group and, uh, and decide on one thing 
that I'm going to put into practice or maybe one thing that I'm going to meditate on and confess with my mouth over myself until I get to the next session, session four, and be a doer of this. That's what that means. And don't just let this be knowledge in your mind. Be a doer of the word and put it into practice. You'll see the fruit and you'll see the results in your life. See you in session four.